Uh, Deputy John Lyons, the Deputy, has uh, four minutes to make an initial statement. Thank you, Cahir, look. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak here today, and Minister, I want to thank you for attending here also. The issue I want to propose is the use of social clauses in public procurement contracts, including quotas, to employ job seekers who are long-term unemployed. As the Minister may be aware, I published a social clause bill late last year and have met with a number of experienced professionals who have drafted social clauses into contracts. This is an issue I have a very strong interest in. As being a resident and a representative for Ballymun, I have seen how massive expenditure, public expenditure in areas can transform the physical environment without fully addressing the issues of long-term unemployment. Minister, in the short time I have, I want to look at how to use public contracts for infrastructure like schools and retrofitting to help the long-term unemployed back into work. I also want to suggest some ways to overcome some of the issues in implementing these clauses based on Irish examples. The number of long-term claimants on the live register in January 2013 was just under 190,000, with about two-thirds of these being men who mainly used to work in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. This is a structural unemployment issue, as we are all aware of. And as well as, as, as well as retraining options, we need to maximise the employment opportunities for those job seekers from public spending in the economy. Recently, Minister, I listened with interest to your discussion on social clauses in recent weeks and your support for examining the further use of social clauses. In particular, you, you outlined the key challenges to introducing social clauses, and you mentioned four items. You mentioned ensuring that a value for money approach was necessary, complying with EU treaties and procurement directives such as uh, contracts that wouldn't be discriminatory, and ensuring no cost burden is added to businesses in applying for tenders. And you also mentioned the difficulties in the monitoring of compliance with social clauses. You also outlined the areas to focus on to best achieve our aims in this area. You mentioned three items, Minister. You mentioned focusing social clauses for services and work contracts rather than supply contracts. You also mentioned applying social considerations as contract performing performance conditions and using social clauses to support labour activation policies. I have looked at all of these issues in detail, Minister, and I believe we can achieve this balance using the experience of similar examples already available in, on Ireland, in Ireland. In the Grange Gorman DIT plan, for instance, there was an employment opportunity study carried out to see how this long-term project could benefit in Dublin's north inner city. This study proposes local labour partnerships be set up to work with contractors and subcontractors to identify their skills needs and to provide the training and upskilling needed for the workers. They also propose long-term strategies around upskilling so the community benefits from the post-construction phase. Similar partnerships could be set up for large infrastructural projects like Limerick Regeneration and the National Children's Hospital. One minute, Deputy. For small, thank you, Cahirlock. For smaller works, the linkages with local job centres could provide knowledge of the skills and experience in an area before a project starts, which would help with local access uh, for work with contractors. All of these are excellent ideas, but to get to the long-term unemployment, but to get the long-term unemployed back into jobs, we have to look at quotas. We know from, from the evidence that the longer someone is out of work, the harder it is for them to come back into the labour market. If we apply quotas for the long-term unemployed to public infrastructural projects, we would not be using a higher local social clause, so therefore we would not be using discriminatory ways. Also, to implement and oversee the contracts, we could look at staging the tenders or making them smaller therefore giving us opportunities for oversight by including past compliance in the assessment of new tenders. And Minister, finally, I hope these points can be taken into consideration of social clauses and public procurement in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. The Minister has four minutes to reply. Uh, last, Karen Corla, can I thank uh, Deputy Lyons for raising this uh, matter in the House today, and I want to also thank him for the interest he has shown in this issue. Uh, and indeed for the publication of legislation uh, that he has published in his own right. Uh, as he rightly said, the, the matter of social clauses in public contracts is something that I've been examining uh, very closely uh, in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. Social clauses can be used in public procurement in cases uh, where they're targeted at factoring into the procurement process consideration of social issues such as employment opportunities, equal opportunities and social inclusion. In order to be uh, compatible with EU law, 
uh, they must be made known to all interested parties and must not restrict participation uh, by contractors from other member states. The European Commission issued guidance uh, in 2010 that identified a range of social considerations that could be relevant for procurement, including promoting employment opportunities for young unemployed or long-term unemployed and promoting compliance with core labour standards. This guidance stressed that when incorporating social considerations into the procurement process, one of the key challenges is ensuring compliance with the EU uh, treaty principles and the procurement directives. The EU procurement directives primarily envisage that social considerations may be included as contract performance conditions, providing that they are not discriminatory and are included in the contract notice or in the contract documents and relate to the performance of the contract. For example, last year, look, the, um, the EU directive states that contract performance conditions may be intended to favour on-site vocational training, the employment of people experiencing particular difficulties in achieving integration, the fight against unemployment or the protection of the environment. Challenges arise from the need to ensure that value for money is not adversely affected. Additional costs are not placed on domestic suppliers relative to other potential suppliers, and the target benefit is capable of being measured and monitored during the execution of the contract. The Deputy uh, is obviously aware uh, that proposals for a revised set of EU di directives governing public procurement are being considered at the present. Um, the inclusion of social considerations in public procurement procedures, specifically at the contract award stage, is an issue that's being addressed in the reform of public procurement directives. In this regard, the, the, devised, the revised directive, when implemented, should uh, provide greater scope and legal clarity uh, in relation to the use of social criteria at contract award stage. Reaching agreement on public procurement dossiers is, of course, a key priority for the Irish Presidency of the European Union. In relation to the proposal that all public procurement contracts include a requirement that a quota of long-term unemployed be employed in the delivery of all uh, procurement contracts uh, poses us a number of significant risks in the current economic climate and in particular bearing in mind the difficulties in the construction sector businesses have for obvious reasons uh, been reducing their existing workforce rather than taking on new employees uh, consequently it's likely that where a business is awarded a public contract in particular a small-scale contract, uh, the work would be carried out by the existing employees of that business. In such circumstances, a social clause requiring uh, that a number of long-term unemployed are employed uh, in, in delivering a public contract uh, could either impose an additional cost on SMEs uh, that may not be able to afford it, or result in an employee of the supplier being let go in favour of a long-term unemployed person. Now, the inclusion of social clauses in the procurement process would therefore appear to be most suited in situations where the social benefit could be considered a core requirement and can be linked directly uh, to the contracting authority's policy or strategic plan. I think the Deputy already said that in his remarks to the House. Experience in other member states would also indicate that social clauses uh, will tend to be used for, for services and, and works contracts rather than supply contracts. A further consideration is the ability of contracting authorities to effectively monitor compliance with the social clause. This may be more difficult where some of the work is performed in, in, in another member state. Obviously, the main purpose of the public procurement process is to ensure that goods, services and works are purchased by the state in a, matter, in a manner that's legal, transparent and of high uh, probity. And our key requirement is the achievement, of course, of value for money. But in this context, my department and the National Procurement Service are examining a targeted approach to the use of social clauses focused on contracts, in particular uh, of the con uh, contract um, of the capital area uh, where employees are likely uh, to be hiring additional uh, workers to deliver the contract. This is likely to mitigate the risk of displacing workers already in employment while offering the opportunity of assisting uh, with labour activation measures for the long-term unemployed. Thank you, Minister. The Deputy has two minutes for a supplementary. Thank you, Kier uh, um, Minister, I must say thanks very much to your very positive response to an issue that I've been working on since I've come in here. Um, I must say I agree with what, what, what 
what you've said in many respects. Um, I mean, I think some of the obstacles that we see in our way, such as the possible displacement of, of people who are working full time, uh, we need to see beyond the obstacle and see the solution to, to in, or, in order to address that. Um, the reality is, as both you know and I know, that um, retraining alone is not going to give everybody a job and that we are a big spender. We are, build, we are building numerous amounts of schools over the, the lifetime of this government. We are building a, a lot of infrastructure projects as well over the lifetime of this government. We've got a huge national children's hospital that, please God, will be built or they will start quite soon, not to mention a Limerick regeneration which is underway. We have opportunities which are in front of us. We haven't lived up to those opportunities as of yet. And I'm glad to see that we are changing our vision and our view of how social clauses can be used in order to address the huge amount of people who are unemployed. And I just want to bring it back to one figure. Out, as I said earlier on, Minister, out of that 190,000 people who are long-term unemployed as in the figures as late as January 2013, almost two-thirds of those are men and we're working in the construction se uh, sector. We have a workforce. Uh, ready-made. We have shovel-ready projects to go. Um, I admire the, the creative thinking that's coming from uh, your department on this, and I do look forward to, to seeing some issue around addressing quotas <coughs> and giving people long who are long-term unemployed, uh, getting them back into the workforce. And I really do think that we have to learn from best practice. And from the, I, I'm, I know my time is short, so I'm speaking really fast here, and from meeting with some of the experts that I have met with who have been involved in the public procurement process, even as the legislation stands from an EU perspective, we can do it already. And hopefully with the new EU legislation and objectives that are coming down the road, it will open horizons and expand our opportunities to develop um, offers of social clauses for people who are long-term unemployed in particular. Thank you, Vera, thank, thank you, thank you Minister. Minister, two minutes. I very much agree with what the Deputy said, and I want to thank him for the interest he's shown in this area. He's led in this area, and I, I, I and the Department do appreciate that. <coughs> he highlighted the challenge of unemployment, and if I can put one statistic on, on the record of the House at uh, last count quarter, it's this, uh, that um, effectively half of our unemployed are now considered long-term unemployed. It's, it's, a, it's a dreadful statistic uh, in a circumstance where so many people have lost their jobs. I understand about 60% of the people who have lost their jobs in the last four years uh, were directly or indirectly related to the construction sector. So we are looking at this in a creative way. Uh, I don't want this kind of navel-gazing experience to go on forever. I want to see action on this. I've told my officials this, and we want to get this over the line. Uh, I think we can do it under existing legislation. I think we can do it under existing EU directives. Um, when one considers uh, that the government is, is planning to spend between 2013 and 2016 over 13.1 billion uh, on construction, uh, there's clearly an opportunity to do something here. One of the areas that we're looking at, Deputy, is if we looked at the question of public-private partnerships, which I think is about 1.3 billion, and the argument we would make on that is it is additional infrastructural projects. We, we, and I think we're looking at whether or not we could make a start in that area to see if we could make progress here. I think it, I'm sure the Deputy appreciates this. It needs to be a targeted approach. It needs to be legal. Uh, we can't restrict people from other uh, member states of the European Union, as he, as he well knows. We don't want to have a displacement effect whereby you're putting out of business uh, effectively people who are working in another area who are viable, who aren't debt-ridden that other, construct, other construction companies are in. And I think the key is where a contractor um, who has won a contract um, uh, by the state needs to employ additional workers, that I think that's, that's, it's the, the social clause consideration fits best in that circumstance because they're employing additional people to deliver the infrastructural project. And that's something uh, that we need to do. So, as he rightly points out, this needs to be compatible with EU law, but we want to get this over the line. And, and I appreciate the opportunity that he's given me here today to give out this public message to the department and others to get on with this so that we can get this in place. Uh, this is something we're going to do. Uh, obviously, it has to be legal and Thank correct. You, Minister. But I'm very satisfied that we can get this over the line. Thank you, Minister. If I can say. Uh,